Lesson 7. Mortality vs. Morbidity There appears to be a trade-off between lower mortality and an extension of morbidity. This means we live longer, but are sick for longer. Although we are bound to get sick and die as we age, Lieberman argues that aging isn't the only problem. Nearly every published analysis on changing health trends is based on the last 100 years using data on people from the industrial or agricultural era. There's no consideration of hunter-gatherer health. It's like trying to figure out who won a game of basketball using only the goals scored in the last few minutes. Additionally, multiple studies consistently rank the following factors as significant causes of prolonged illness in developed nations. High blood pressure, overuse of alcohol, tobacco smoking, no surprise, pollution, a diet low in fruit, and much more. None of these risk factors were common before the agricultural and industrial revolutions. So Lieberman concludes that it is possible to live a long and healthy life without being affected by chronic non-infectious diseases that cause years of disability. We'll learn how in the following lessons. Lesson 8. Use it or lose it. Our bodies are designed to grow and evolve. Your body expects and requires certain stresses when you are maturing in order to develop properly. Let's take wisdom teeth for example the four teeth that are last to emerge in the back of your mouth. For some people, wisdom teeth don't have enough room to emerge, so they can cause pain, infection, and nerve damage. Most end up having oral surgery and getting braces. Braces are metal bands that apply constant pressure to teeth to move them where they should be. Most of the skulls from the last few hundred years are a dentist's nightmare. Teeth are filled with cavities, infections, and teeth are crowded into the jaw. 25% of them have impacted wisdom teeth. For millions of years, humans had no problem growing wisdom teeth, but innovations and food preparation techniques have buggered up the old system. Genes and mechanical loads from chewing enable the teeth and jaws to grow together properly. But now we mash, whip, boil, chop, dice, ground and process nearly everything to make them soft and tender. Ancient humans gnawed on roasted animals, roughly chopped veggies and roots. Your jaw muscles will get tired quickly because they aren't used to working that hard. Studies of Australian Aborigines who recently switched to Western diets show they now have smaller jaws and tooth crowding problems. So when it comes to teeth, use them or lose them. The same concept applies to your whole body. We can visit the dentist, but again, that's treating the symptoms, not the causes. Let's move on to lesson nine, shoes versus bare feet. So what if I told you wearing shoes isn't normal? My mum has pestered me to wear my shoes for my whole life, <laughs> and she still does today. Going barefoot is considered strange and unhygienic. Controversy came about after the release of the best-selling book Born to Run. Many runners believe everyone should wear supportive shoes to avoid injury and that barefoot running is just a passing fad. People have been wearing shoes for thousands of years, often without apparent harm, and they're comfortable. On the flip side, consider that the most important function of shoes is to protect the bottom of your feet. Your skin naturally creates calluses when you go barefoot to help protect your feet. But when you wear shoes, it inhibits the formation of calluses and leads us to wear shoes more often, creating a feedback loop. Shoes also limit sensory feedback from the nerves in your feet. This feedback triggers reflexes to help you avoid injury from hot, uneven, or sharp surfaces. You know, that random block of Lego that just happens to be lying on the floor. It also aids your stability. When I was on my unicycle balancing on a rail in front of Niagara Falls, I instinctively went barefoot to help stabilize myself. When running, we normally strike our heels to the ground first, which can hurt in bare feet. But this can be avoided with a forefoot strike, which is landing with the balls of your feet before the heel. Get up from your seat and jump barefoot, and you'll see what I mean. Many of the world's best runners forefoot strike even when they are wearing shoes. But heel striking isn't all that bad. You can take bigger strides and it requires less strength from your calf muscles. It's also easier on the Achilles tendon in your ankle. But the point Lieberman tries to make is that when you heel strike in a cushioned shoe, your body no longer gets the sensory feedback it needs to help alter the impact. If you run in cushioned shoes with poor form, it's easy to hit the ground hard with every step. Over the long term, this can be damaging which Lieberman backs with studies. Running shoes also have arch supports or orthotics and a sole that curves upward at the front. These innovations are designed to be comfortable, stylish, and reduce the amount of work your muscles need to do. But by restricting your muscles from working as hard, they can become weaker, leading to issues such as plantar fasciitis, that sharp pain some people get in the bottom of their feet. 
We continue to treat the symptoms rather than the causes. Doctors will prescribe medications, orthotics, or more comfortable shoes. Liebman argues that we need to look at how people actually move when they walk and run, and to gain a better understanding of how to adapt people with weaker feet to the greater muscular demands of wearing minimal shoes. If we continue to slap comfortable shoes on, podiatrists will continue to be very busy. My personal decision is to go barefoot wherever possible. The area around my home is safe enough to go on walks in bare feet. I sometimes go to local shops in bare feet. It's socially acceptable in some places here in Australia. <laughs> Thank God. When I was in Thailand, I was staying with my couch surfing host who was French. He offered me a ride on his bike around the village, but as I took off on the bike without wearing shoes, he beckoned me back and asked me to put on shoes because apparently I looked like a hobo, <laughs> which I was aware of. But anyway, I succumbed to his request out of politeness. Now for lesson 10, the hidden dangers of reading. Staring at words, a phone, or anything close to your face isn't natural. My mum used to tell me my eyes would go square if I played video games all day. I think that's why she used to tell me to go outside instead of playing Crossbox all day. She was referring to the Nintendo GameCube, by the way, but you know what mums are like. Focusing has benefits, but may come at the cost of poor vision. Nearly 33% of children between age 7 and 17 become nearsighted and need glasses to see properly. Wearing glasses is now normal and even fashionable, but evidence suggests being nearsighted was rare. Studies show rates of myopia or nearsightedness was less than 3% among hunter-gatherers. Lieberman makes several other arguments, including the fact that people's genes haven't changed much in the last few hundred years. So the recent worldwide epidemic of myopia must result primarily from changes in our environment. Secondly, we know that children's eyeballs are becoming longer, possibly due to focusing on nearby objects for extended periods which increases pressure inside the eye. Most cases of nearsightedness happen when the eyeball is lengthened. Lieberman humbly admits that there's still so much we don't know about myopia, but based on what we do know, our efforts to prevent myopia deserve more attention. We continue to treat the symptoms by prescribing glasses and contact lenses, which may be contributing to that thing we learn in lesson three called disevolution. To address a problem, perhaps we could encourage children to spend more time outside or project children's books onto walls. For me personally, I'd read books for long periods for my whole life, even if I knew I would get myopia. I'd slap on some glasses and keep reading because books are my passion. Screw you, myopia. Lesson 11. Is sitting the new smoking? You've probably heard this phrase around recently. Let's see what all the fuss is about. In the late 1920s, two young men invented a reclining chair known as the Lazy Boy. Today's models offer 18 comfort levels with all sorts of crazy innovations. By paying extra, you can add features like vibrating motors, tilting seats, cup holders, and more. I was surprised to see that some of these babies exceed $5,000. We sit for much longer periods than we used to. From an evolutionary perspective, sitting is unusual, but are chairs unhealthy? Lieberman tells us not to worry. He doesn't intend to make us feel bad about sitting in chairs. He has no intention of getting rid of chairs in his own house. But there are reasons to be concerned about the amount of time we spend in chairs, especially if we are inactive for the rest of the day. One concern is energy balance. For every hour you sit at a desk, you spend 20 less calories than if you were to stand because you are no longer exercising certain muscles that support and shift your weight. Standing for eight hours a day is equivalent to a half hour walk. Over time, the energetic difference between sitting and standing is huge. Another concern is muscle atrophy. To make it easy for you, Lieberman basically says that by not sitting in chairs and not using our muscles causes them to weaken over time. They lose fibers that give us endurance. So it's a good idea for anyone spending long hours in a chair to get up and stretch regularly. A final concern is lower back pain, which is a problem for a huge amount of people today. It's a complex problem that still needs answers. But if we consider evolution, there's clues that sitting all day or lifting heavy things like a furniture removalist does can lead to back pain. Lieberman concludes that overstressing our backs causes us to develop weak and inflexible backs, especially when we sit in chairs to relieve the pain. Backs become weaker from disuse. We then get handed medicine to alleviate the pain, causing yet again that vicious feedback loop called disevolution, treating the symptoms, not the causes. So what can we make of all this? Well, to sum up, we love modern day comforts, but our bodies aren't well adapted for them. As a result, 
Billions of people suffer from diseases that were once rare or unknown. We then treat the symptoms instead of the causes because it's easier and more profitable. But in doing so, we pass on an environment to the next generation that makes things worse. We don't yet know how to cure the major diseases that kill people, but we do know how to lessen their chances and sometimes prevent them by using our bodies how they were evolved to be used. The future of your body depends on how you use it. After reading this book, I now eat more almonds, wear shoes less often, and am encouraged to take exercise more seriously as I develop five habits this year. I hope this video can make a change in your life. If you're interested in the science behind Daniel's research, I recommend reading the book. If you need motivation to read, consider joining my online book club where we hold each other accountable to reading a self-development book every two weeks. For a small commitment of 10 bucks a month, you'll get access to my private Facebook group of like-minded people. You'll get access to accountability buddies to help achieve your reading goals. I'll give you access to 10 free eBooks. You'll be eligible for free book giveaways, and you'll be able to interact with me personally through private videos and Facebook discussions. To join, just head to 1%bookclub.com and I'll leave a link in the description below for you.